So yesterday we discussed the uh, thermal radiation from expanding material, but we didn't really discuss about the, what makes the what generate energy to this uh, expanding material. So today the main topic will be what is the energy source of the of energy source powering kilonova emission. Let's look at this. Uh, So this is a light curve. It, uh, I didn't define the light curve in a tutorial, but now let me define what is light curve. It's light curve is uh, the luminosity as a function, or luminosity of flux as a function of time. So we call this a light curve. And now this is it. And, uh, as we discussed yesterday, here was uh, like 10 to the 42 L per second, about 0.5 days. And as we probably you did some exercise in a tutorial yesterday, in order to explain this luminosity at 0.5 days, so your initial internal energy from the merger is not sufficient. It's much, much, we expect much fainter luminosity from just uh, the radiation coming from uh, uh, internal energy created by the merger itself. So we need some, we need some additional energy or this uh, uh, observed the kilonova. And if you just uh, take this value, think the 42 ergo per second at 0.5 days, so what, how much energy do you have? So this is uh, just, uh, let's say, 10 to 42 ergo per second times, uh, let's say, one day. So this is at least you need to explain that this uh, emission. Two. So this is about uh, what is this, 10 to the 47 erg. And now, for convenience, I want to convert this 10 to the 47 erg to MEV. So this is a uh, one erg is about uh, one TeV, right? So one erg is about one TeV, so which means uh, this is four, sorry, 53 MEV. So. This peak energy is about 10, uh, 10 to 53 MeV. And as we saw yesterday, the, the mass that requires to get to this peak is about 0 0.01 solar mass. So the mass was, the ejector mass is about 0 0.01 solar mass. And how many new, oh, sorry. <laughs> and now I want to ask how many nuclei we have this uh, in a, uh, Ejector. So let's take uh, uh, heavy nuclei, like uh, the mass of the nuclear, let's assume 100 times uh, atomic unit, so which is about uh, 1.7 times 10 to the min minus 22 gram. Right, and this solar mass is uh, so 0 0.021 times 2 times. So, number of nuclei I have in this ejector is about uh, this divided by this. So, what is this? This is uh, 2 10 to the 31. Uh, let's say this is in the 50, oh sorry, so nuclei. So I just assume here the atomic mass number, atomic uh, mass number is about 100. So now you can see interesting uh, facts that I have uh, this number of nuclei in the ejector, roughly, and this much of, of energy. So just divided by this energy, I can get uh, one MeV per nuclei. So which means, 
So the 1 MeV is a typical uh, energy scale of the decay. So just looking at this, uh, how much energy I need to explain this kilonova and how much mass I have, I can just uh, get a rough number of the radioactivity. So this is one reason that the, uh, this motivates us to consider more details of uh, the radioactive heat as a power of uh, uh, kilonova. So, but before I'm going to details, let me introduce the questions so far. Yes. Sorry, but so the, there were different processes which all lead lead to kilonova emission, right? Two kilonova emission. Uh, but uh, how does this, like, only this particular thing explain, like, all the other? I mean, um, even if the luminosity or the light curve matches. Yes, yes. Yeah. Here, I, I just, uh, I wanted to show the energy scale is about the. Uh, the energy scale of radioactivity. So later I will show what is the time dependence of this heating rate and how it looks like. So, so I just uh, leave this, it like this, like uh, just sim simplest energy argument. Okay. Okay. So before I'm going to details, let me, in, so yesterday we didn't really talk about uh, what is the R process and uh, uh, <coughs> what is heavy element. So let me first start with this uh, uh, R process. So R process has a, a long history, and maybe more than 50, 60 years ago. So this is, a, if you look at the abundance distribution of the material, I mean abundance distribution of the atoms, so this is, a, I will write down a bit complicated figure, but try, let me try. This is a, in a, the abundance part of the solar system. So, the, so the here is about 50, the mass number of 50. And uh, let's say here is 100 and uh, 150. Here's 200. And these are uranium and maybe here, thorium, uranium. So, yes, this is what we call iron peak. The, the, we have many uh, large abundance of iron because uh, this is a most stable element and also can be produced inside the stellar explosion. So supernova now, supernovae are considered the main source of the iron. And beyond that, we also have a small amount, but still we have a some abundance of the heavy element. And let's like log, oh, sorry. So this is the log abundance of each element. So the, the, it's a little bit weird unit, but here is five. So normalized by log silicon abundance to be six. The iron is about uh, 10 times less than silicon. And these heavy elements are like, uh, this is uh, zero. It's about uh, five or that below the iron abundance peak. And if you look at the, so the 50 years ago, 60 years ago, people look at this uh, uh, abundance pattern and realize there are two processes produce this kind of pattern. So 
now we call this R process and S process. Let's look at the, what is these processes. So in a solar abundance, if you look at solar abundance, particularly this uh, side, this heavy element side, there is some uh, little bit wide peak and then sharp peak. And now almost flat and again, a little bit wide peak and then sharp rise. So these are explained by two processes. One is S process and one is R process. And uh, now I need to explain some nuclear synthesis. So this is a neutron number and this is proton number Z. This is solar, solar. for the sun. Uh, I would say the solar system. So that this abundance pattern is coming from either meteor or uh, photospheric abundance of the sun. So it's a yeah, yeah. So and uh, people sort of use some best measurement of the uh, abundance pattern. And if you look at the solar neighborhood stars, it's very interestingly, the abundance is very similar to the sun. I don't know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe some nuclear physicists know, no? Someone knows why the silicon is the base? Okay. <laughs> I think if take it, the hydrogen to be the base, it's too small. Too small. <laughs> Silicon is, I think, good value to see helium and iron peak. <laughs> so this is a, usually we see some nuclear synthesis calculation in this plane. So this is the number of neutron in the nucleide, and then this is proton, number of plot protons. So roughly here, this is stable. This is a stable line. For example, here is uh, iron 56 is here. And uh, uh, so in order to, so because as I said, this is the most uh, stable element. So in order to get much heavier, even though they are stable, but uh, this is the most stable, so energetically, this is the uh, most uh, preferred one. So in order to get this uh, heavier element, you need to, you need to some, uh, some neutron capture process or proton capture process to, so to, hit, to hit the neutron to the iron and then make another one and then go up this way. And it is important to note there is a magic number, so-called magic number here, so neutron magic number. So according to the nuclear shell model, uh, there, is, there are magic numbers which, of which the shell of the neutrons or protons are closed, so the, those uh, nuclei are more stable compared to others. So 28 is magic number, which is very close to the iron. And next one, 50. Uh, I can't remember these numbers. 82 and 126. So if you, your process is very slow compared to the neutron lifetime, what happens is I begin with, for example, iron and uh, put neutron and go which way? Go this way. Right, additional neutron number, and then this one decays. And because my process is very slow, so I can continue this process something like this, go this way one step, and go back. So I can continue this process. And what happens is uh, when you en encounter the magic number, this nu these nuclei are more and more stable, so we need, I need more, up, given the neutron flux, flux, I need more number of magic number nuclei, right? 
in order to go next step. So in S process, we always have more abundance at the magic number. So this is why this is actually magic number here. So S process peak this, and maybe here. So the right, the, this is correspond to the this uh, magic number, right? So this is S process that uh, it's occurred occurs in uh, all the stars, but now we are interested in uh, our process, which is more rapid. Rapid means this uh, neutron capture process is faster than the beta decay, so we don't get this uh, de decay each step. So what happens is there is some yes neutron drip line, and because my Neutron flux is too large and very fast, so the, this nuclear synthesis goes this way. So close to the neutron drip neutron line, and then, because again, we have magic number here, so these are more up than here. So I initially produced this uh, Let's forget about this. So this process synthesizes nuclei here, and they, they are radioactive, so they decay to, so they go decay in this way. Why this way? Because we have beta decay, so which is uh, conserve the total number of neutron to proton, and one neutron converted to proton, and then, so this is conserving the total num mass number of the, each nucleide, and then goes this way to back to the st stable point. So, and now you can see, because I have more nuclei here, so these nuclei go back to go here, right? And this guy is here. So just a little bit lower than the magic number S process peak, I have R process peak here. So this is why I have some, uh, there are some broader peak just next to the S process peak. Right. Yeah, what I need is a large number of neutrons and very high density. Then this, uh, this capturing process is faster than the neutron decay. So then I have this. Process. But uh, this can only occur some explosion system because it's very fast. It's, uh, you, have to be, you have to do this about one second or something like this. So you need some uh, neutron rich and explosion, and dense explosion. So this is a, we call so this is some overlap, but here fast R process peak. And this is called second peak and third peak. So we, we usually say so this is some overlap with the S process, but there are three peaks, first, second, and third peak. And it, it is interesting that uh, we, if you look at the, the stars near, near the sun, you see these peaks as well. And the abundance ratio, for example, abundance ratio of second and third peak are very, very similar all different stars. So that's why I think these uh, heavy R process is synthesized like uh, single events, I mean, single kind of event, not like a different kind of event for different, different abundance pattern, and, and in the end, we expect uh, some variation. But uh, if the single kind of event produces 
our process, we expect uh, always similar abundance pattern for the second, third peak. But if you look at the, the ratio of the first and second peak, you see some variation. So now it's uh, astrophysically still uh, it's a big question that uh, our, if you say this event produces our process element, so th that means our process element from all the way from first peak to the uranium or just heavy part of the R process. This is uh, one big uh, issue in astrophysics. If your neutron richness is not, not very high, right? what, neutron, what happens in neutron star merger usually is neutron richness is very high, like uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some event produce this very, with very high concentration of neutron. Some event just like produce something like this. After the third peak, after the third peak, are, these are unstable. So unfortunately, we don't see. They are, even though they are synthesized just after our process, they are there, there probably, but they just decay, and to this, uh, they are under here. So what we see is just uh, synthesized all the way from here to there, but these are unstable and then decay coming back to here. So we, what we see is some uh, after the fission. Yeah. Yeah, maybe this is, yeah, this is actually a bit higher than the third peak, actually. Yeah. So. Right. <clears throat> Okay, now, so after the hour process, what we expect is, uh, so these are far from stability line, they decay. So these radiation, radioactive energy powers the, uh, uh, this kilonova. So one way to calculate how much what is the heating rate from this uh, decay is just uh, you calculate all the decay chain with given abundance and some them. But this is uh, what usually people do. But uh, now I want to take another approach that we have so many nuclei, different species, don't have to care each, what each, line, each decay do. So I just use uh, some statistical argument to, to get the heating rate. So yesterday, we, in a tutorial, we had this problem that uh, what uh, in a, for the supernova, we have uh, this decay chain. Nickel 56, cobalt 56. So this, if I write down D and DT, and uh, divided by initial number of the uh, nuclei in this chain. So I begin with uh, here. Right, this is nickel, uh, which is, uh, and then after nickel decay, then I have a uh, cobalt decay. And basically, this follows something like uh, this point should be the mean life of the nickel and the heat, this point this point should be one over tau cobalt. So this is just two very simple the simple case you have two different different species, but now we are thinking. There are many nuclei goes like in this one chain. So you have is instead of two. So first the nuclei decay, and second one coming, and third one, something like this. And if you have sufficiently many many nuclei in a chain, what you expect is D and DT just goes like. One of the 
Yes. Yes. Right. And because the uh, decay rate goes like 1 over t, so you can, if you know the energy of the decay at each time, you know the heating rate, right? Q dot should go to the E over T. And for the first step, for example, this famous paper, this is the first paper that talk about the uh, kilonova. We unpack. I don't know if it's I or Y. Why? I? OK. <laughs> so in, in this paper, they first discussed this uh, radioactive powered uh, neutron star merger counterpart. And what they do is uh, they assume E is constant. So they statistically, OK, Q dot, let's assume that Q dot goes like 1 over T. This is the first guess. This is not so bad, but uh, actually, if you look at the beta decay properties, I have a good, interesting relationship between lifetime and energy. So in the beta decay, there's a the relation between lifetime and uh, decay energy, which goes so that if the decay energy is very large, your lifetime is uh, shorter. So this is very strong power, but uh, what it says is decay energy, so lifetime here is very short and then goes longer. So the energy release from each beta decay is larger here and then smaller here. And roughly, the lifetime and the energy goes like this. So, it's actually, I can use this relation. It's a, just simple this, uh, I will explain why this is so from the beta decay theory, but now let's take this and then the heating rate declined a bit faster than linear. And also I know, I can normalize this. Now I will derive these quantities, but uh, let's say. Now the, in the beta decay theory, the typical characteristic energy scale is MEC square, right? Electron. Energy is a characteristic energy, electron, electron mass energy. And there's also the fundamental time scale of the beta decay, which is, uh, goes like Fermi coupling constant, one over Fermi coupling constant squared, which is about uh, this time. So using this and MEC square, Q dot, this is a heating rate per unit nuclei, nu nucleide, should be this time scale and this energy scale. So this is a per second per nucleus. <clears throat> so if you can, if you take these values and then calculate heating rate per nucleus, which is a roughly right value that people get from this uh, uh, nucleosynthesis calculation. So now I want to refine this uh, calculation a little bit. Questions? Oh, this is a cup. Yeah, this is, I will uh, explain more. Uh, 
Now, what I want to calculate is this relation. So this is the, how the lifetime of a beta unstable nuclei goes as a function of energy of beta decay. So this is what I want to calculate, and then now I will use this, uh, what Fermi developed in, in 1930s. So beta. So in a beta decay, I have a parent nucleus in which one neutron is here, and this decays to the daughter nucleus. This is a proton. And in this process, electron and uh, neutrino, maybe I put the anti electron neutrino are radiated. And he described this uh, process as just single point interaction and coupling constant to be GF. And what Fermi did is uh, calculate the lifetime using this coupling constant, this just very simple coupling, and uh, how the lifetime of the beta decay depends on the, these energies, and also what is the shape of the electron spectrum. If you measure emitted electron energy, what is the shape of the in electron number as a function of energy, or something like this. So first important thing is uh, I have, so in this process, I need to conserve the energy and the momentum. And uh, this involves, so let's assume this is uh, at least, initially this is uh, zero. And finally, it has three particles. And then from the energy conservation, sorry, uh, mo momentum conservation, Momentum. I can show that the energy of the daughter nuclei, I call this recoil energy. Recoil energy divided by the electron's energy is about the mass of the daughter nuclei. And the energy of the electron. This is simply because you have mom momentum conservation. So the momentum of this, this, this are the same order. But this one is very, very heavy. So the energy that you get is, uh, the energy of the heavy particle is suppressed by the mass ratio. This is just the uh, momentum conservation. So in this sense, this is a very heavy, you know, the Dota nuclei, nucleus is much heavier than the M electron. So I can neglect the recoil energy. So in that way, I can just think the two particles here. Neutrino has zero masses? Yes, I haven't introduced, but yes, I will. You can do in the exercise what, if you wish, you can put the neutrino mass, and then what will be the difference? You can look at this problem. So, yes, what Fermi did is uh, that this process is this process occurs equally likely to each phase space. So. I have a so these uh, uh, momentums are carried by two particles, and they, they have phase space. So the phase space volume phase uh, let's see. 
So let's take a dimensionless phase space volume. Long. So this is a phase space factor. This is uh, just uh, the phase space volume of the momentum. I should put this is here. This is momentum volume element, and this is neutrino momentum volume element, and this is electron neutrino uh, volume element. So the assumption is just uh, each of the phase space number has the same probability of decay. And now I can use the energy conservation and uh, so let's assume this decay. So energy conservation, so E0 is the decay energy, should be uh, E electron plus E mu. And because I want to use the, this Fermi's golden rule, so I want to use this relation, BP nu is equal to uh, And if you remember the Fermi's uh, golden rule, so what he, so it's the decay probability is proportional to the phase space density, which is uh, phase density of state, yes, density of state. Is uh, just this uh, phase space, number of phase space, Now I can, I'm interested in uh, this, uh, what is the electron energy spectrum, and I'm not really interested in the direction of the emission and also the volume factor. So just integrate these. What in the end you find is uh, so this is volume factor from this. Now, <clears throat> so the, the de decay probability The decay probability per unit time, per unit momentum, electron momentum interval is uh, so if you remember the Fermi's golden rule, it's uh, the interaction Hamiltonian. Squares, so, so this is just the probability of this that interaction squared times this rho e. So this is just uh, the unit of uh, one of our energy. So this is a unit of uh, energy square 
uh, you have to divide it by two pi algebra to get the one over uh, pi unit time. So this is a decay probability of this uh, beta decay. And this is just uh, this factor, just we I calculate. And what is this? This is uh, coming from uh, this interaction. So I can write down this is the coupling constant is G and integrate over the final state of my problem is the, I have an electron. This is the final state. And neutrino in a final state and the delta nuclei at final state. and uh, let's say parent nuclei, and they integrate over the volume. So they are interacting uh, at single uh, location. And now for, so the, the simplest problem is just to consider no angular momentum for this uh, electron neutrino. So I can assume, for example, zero angular momentum carried by these two particles. This is, and we call it the allowed beta decay. And you can add the angular momentum, but these probability are small, and then we call it forbidden transitions. So let's assume the orbital angular momentum of these are zero. So let's say. Then the wave function is very uh, simply psi electron at zero is simply something like this. This is just. I mean, this is just, uh, let's say, and they evaluate it at uh, zero. It's just square root of V. And neutrino, so let's see. Uh, something like this. And then if we assume zero angular momentum and uh, you evaluate at v equal zero. So this factor here just give you psi zero star and psi so the just the normalization of the wave function. So in the end G Fermi divided by the volume and this some uh, overlap function with the parent nuclei and the delta nuclei. So unfortunately, we don't know what is this, but we know this uh, factor. So I define uh, this is as a nuclear matrix element, and just this is overlap function between the final and the uh, initial final state of the nucleus. Then I can. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, this is not proton. This is a parent nuclei. So let's. <laughs> this is a proton and neutrino. But I, I wrote this is a delta and parent. So, but uh, yeah, this is a proton and neutron in, in the nucleus. So the mean life is uh, this is decay probability per unit time. So this can be obtained like the integral over up to some p max. So this is a so this density of state times this one squared. 
this, this is a disk factor. And then you can see this phase space volume square here is cancelled with the normalization of the wave function, V squared. So I have an unknown nuclear matrix element squared. And then just a combination of the coupling constant and the mass of the electrons integrated over Let's see. So T E not minus, yeah, yes, yes. Yes. So after, so here I just, I already normalized this momentum and energy with the mass of the electron and the speed of light. Then I get the, E not minus E, yes, I just drop the E. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I just, uh, I explained too fast. So yes, so in this problem, we have some scales, right? This uh, scale of the nucleus and the scale of uh, the wave length of these particles. So actually, so these are confined in the nucleus and this process happens in the nucleus scale, right? And they are confined here, but for them, this is just point particle. So the, the lambda, let's say double wavelengths of the electron is much, much longer than the size of the nucleus. So that we can take this process occurs at a single point. So that also, you understand why we can take the, this as a free, like, plane wave function. This is just confined wave function. So this is a sort of famous uh, integral that, this is called the beta spectrum, that if you measure the momentum or energy, of the electron from beta decay, you see this kind of uh, probability distribution because this is just uh, this get this is from just uh, the phase space factor. So usually, okay. uh, we define so it, we define f. We call this is a comparative lifetime. This is calculated by this uh, integral and measure the total energy of the decay. You can calculate this and the half-life you can measure and what you, you can calculate this quantity. So, and then if you look at the, the, so this F distribution of the this quantity, then you see something like this. So 
these are uh, about our, these are, are called the super allowed, allowed, the neutrons or some sort of very simple nuclei here. But usually, allowed transition, you see some peak around 10 to the 5. So this quantity peaking around 10 to the 5. So you, we can get the, what is the mean value of the nuclear matrix element. So that uh, we, even though we don't know what is the overlap function between the proton and the neutron inside the nucleus, from experiment we know what is the mean value of the nuclear matrix element. So using this uh, statistical argument, we get the lifetime as a function of the energy. Oh, this is number. So you can plot the, each different uh, nucleoid, you can measure this uh, quantity. So these are, for example, neutron is here, and uh, for example, other beta unstable nuclei is here or here, something like this. Now we have a lifetime with some scaling and with the normalization. And let's look at the scaling here. If you think this uh, decay energy is uh, much larger than electron's mass, then if the situation is something like this, then you can think of the electron momentum is uh, the energy. You can use this relation. So then the scaling should be, this goes E, E square, one E here, one E here. So E, zero to the five. So this is uh, the one scaling that I was uh, mentioning before. In this regime, the decay energy is larger than MEC squared, then you get the one over tau goes up e to the five. You can also think this uh, different uh, regime that E zero is less than MEC squared. Sorry. So what we we have in this uh, non-relativistic regime is p square goes e. So I have a. I'm sorry. This is square. Seven. So, as you can see, at initially this phase space factor goes like e to the five. But when the electron becomes non relativistic, it goes uh, slower than e to the five. Now, I didn't talk one thing, which is uh, there is another regime that I didn't mention, which is, uh, I assume here, electron is a plane wave. But what actually happened is electron is uh, pulled 
by the central nucleus. So the wave function close to the nucleus is not really the plane wave. You have some modification for this factor. And this factor is important, especially if you go to the low energy, because then the escape velocity of the electron is uh, not sufficient enough, and then it feels the Coulomb force of the nucleus. So actually, what we have to do is uh, modify here 1 over tau. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, some Coulomb force square. This is, this is some modification. When you have a Coulomb interaction, you, have, you enhance some uh, something. Yes, yes, so this is, uh, yes, yeah, I can, I will introduce this, uh, and if you solve the Schrodinger equation with just uh, Coulomb force, you get this uh, factor from exact solution, and what is this, so this factor I define F, uh, E, Z, uh, You're saying the tail of the Coulomb wave function? The problem is now, as you said, uh, as I said, the nuclear size is much, much smaller than the electron wave wavelength. So essentially for this electron, the nucleus located at R equals zero. So you need to evaluate the amplitude at exactly R equal to zero. So you can do this calculation with, this is non-relativistic uh, approximation, but uh, what Fermi did is full relativistic calculation for this factor, but now this is non-relativistic version of this uh, Coulomb factor. And here, eta parameter here is this alpha is uh, one over 37, and then charge of charge number and velocity. So if this is so, sort of a post-Newtonian parameter of the GR, this is Coulomb version of the post-Newtonian parameter. You can see this is, if this, so if velocity is very fast, this factor is very small, then uh, eta is smaller than unity, F is unity. So this is saying the Coulomb interaction is not important for the high energy beta decay. But uh, in opposite case, then F <coughs> is about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, two pi eta. So, so either your charge is large or your velocity is uh, slow, the Coulomb interaction is important. Then you can put this uh, uh, co correction here. Third regime here, which is uh, um, this factor, Let's say one over v.
So these are three regimes that uh, we can really analytically calculate. So first, e to the 5. Tau goes e to the 5, 1 over tau is e to the 3.5, and finally we get e to the 3. So in terms of the heating rate, Heating rate hmm? Yes. Powerful. Yeah. Oh yes, this is also I assume the Yeah, it's uh, in a tutorial, it's uh, <laughs> this calculation, yeah. So now I have three regimes that the uh, E goes like that, that, and this. So I have T to the minus 1.2, T to the minus, uh, uh, what is this? T to the minus, I don't remember this, what is the power? No power, but I think, uh, yeah, I don't remember. You can figure out what is this power. This is first regime, second regime, and third regime. So initially, the decay energy or lifetime is shorter than what you see is uh, the decay power it goes like t to the minus 1.2, and then goes like the second regime, and then finally, what you see is t to the minus 1. Uh, four person, four third. And interestingly, you can calculate also what is the mean energy of the electron from this spectrum. And you can calculate how much energy goes to the electron and how much it goes to the neutrino. So this case is trivial that uh, both electron and neutrino are relativistic, so considered to be massless uh, in particles. So energy of electron and the neutrino are the same. So one half of the energy goes to the electrons. Then you see this regime, this regime, the fraction of the electron energy decreases. So this is also in a tutorial. So and then now, in the end, we can figure out what is the heating rate due to this uh, calculation. So let me show one example. So you can put all the numbers, and in this regime, the heating rate per second per unit mass is uh, This is a charge and mean mass number. And finally, so this is a in the end, you get the by just uh, writing down this calculation. And this is a kilonova heating rate from analytic description. Uh, let me show you some. Uh... The questions? I think we, we, you, you will figure out that this. Uh, calculation in a tutorial, but uh, 
some uh, questions for the logic behind the calculation. Yeah. So for example, for example this is uh, the comparative life that I draw here. It's a bit uh, uh, messy, but uh, here this is a log FT. You can see for the transition, this distribution peaks around uh, 10 to the 5 second. And this is what I use here. And from this uh, experiment, I know what is the mean value of the nuclear matrix element. And these are uh, correspond to the forbidden transition that we so far just neglected, but you can include these uh, with some modifications. Right. Then from this uh, integration, you can calculate, for example, this uh, blue curve here. It's not look like curve, but, but straight, look like straight line. And this is electron heating rate. This is how much energy generated in an electron per unit time per unit mass. And these dotted points are calculated from nuclear synthesis. So you can just, uh, we have a single uh, parameter, and it, not really the parameter, this, we fix this value just from the experiment, then we can nicely reproduce the uh, nuclear synthesis heating rate obtained from nuclear synthesis calculation. So what we assume is just uh, there are so many statistically many, many nuclear beta decay chain, they continue to uh, produce, provide the heat. And if this uh, goes like phase, the probability goes like phase space factor, then you get slightly steeper than 1 over t. So this is... Uh, So I think tomorrow I will talk about the, the story is not the not end, you know, not finished. I mean, we calculated how much energy are radiated in the electrons. Now we want to compute how much energy of the electron is heated up the ejector. So we need to uh, do a little bit more effort. So if this is a kind of observation, the data points here. And if you just compare, so this blue line is the calculation that I show here. And these are the detected point. So you can see the heating rate is far more than the observation. This is, a, this is because electron heating rate is there, but the thermalization process is not so efficient at this time. So you, you have to... So you have to correct this heating rate, taking into account the thermalization efficiency. So after you, you correct this efficiency, what you get is this line. So you need uh, some additional effort to get final shape of the heating. So this uh, maybe uh, we can do it uh, tomorrow. So any questions so far? What do you mean, initial? Oh, yes. Uh, Kilonova powered by actually the f final, I mean, toward the end of the decay chain. Uh, right. So this is uh, the initial abundance pattern. So you are saying initial decay is something like first step of the decay. This occurs very quickly. So this is, for example, this is time scale. This decays like one second. But the kilonova time scale is uh, one day, ten day, and even one month. At that time, these are uh, almost very close to the stability line. So you, you want to care is the decay chain around the stability line. So actually. 
this ca the calculation I showed is a bit too simplified. Why? Because uh, some of the decay chain just uh, already reached to the stability line. So the, the, some of the decay chain just disappear. I didn't take account that effect. So this reduced some uh, heating rate. But on the other hand, I didn't take into account the forbidden transitions. The forbidden transitions gives more large amount of decay energy at longer time scale. So this almost cancels, and uh, coincidentally, Uh, what in the end is very nicely, yeah, coincidentally, in, what in the end you get is very similar to the actual heating rate. But this is uh, not really true, but it's good to describe this uh, phenomenon. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, but yes, that's true. The cancellation a little bit depends on the abundance pattern. But uh, the, this effect is really small. For example, like a uh, yes, very small correction. I may have something. Yeah, so because of uh, these uncertainties, yes, I agree that uh, if there is no uncertainty, so we can always uh, fix the heating rate. But uh, because of uncertainty, I think there are some uh, factor of two uncertainties always here. And again, you need to remember this is the based on the assumption we have uh, many, many chains. But if this, this assumption is not valid, for example, if your heating is dominated by just first peak elements, so for example, this one, so this green curve here is uh, significantly different from the, this uh, ex expectation. Because uh, this one, just I use very, like, just uh, five or ten chains, then my heating rate is dominated by some. Uh, a uh, specific chain, and sometimes I don't have any chain in this uh, list, so I have just very different shape of the heating. So, yes. So, so I was talking about the ionization. Ionization, ionization. ionization of the heavy elements. Ionization of the heavy element doesn't really change the decay probability. But the uh, ionization of the... Their Coulomb correction might it will be different. No, Coulomb correction is not from electrons around the nucleus. Electrons of... Uh, no, sorry. Coulomb correction is from the charge of the nucleus. So... This problem is, we can also cons consider, we can consider, think of this uh, ideal problem. You have no electrons around because it's much larger scale. So we are thinking only just nucleus with the no Coulomb barrier uh, uh, screening effect by the cloud, just as bare nucleus, and then consider the Coulomb effect. But yes, the ionization state affect the summarization efficiency, so this uh, co correction. Okay, yes. All these are done with electroweak uh, things into it, is this? Yes. <laughs> all the interactions, you go beyond the standard Fermi and leave, put in all electroweak physics, all these numbers. That's right, right? 
Uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, electroweak. So, but uh, I just use the fact that electroweak interaction is represented by Fermi coupling constant, and uh, strong interaction is in this uh, nuclear interaction is all, all uh, put in the matrix element. How much correction do you expect if you consider the relativistic case? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you need some. Uh, correction. Right, so this is a true description of the Coulomb correction. In reality, you need to, instead of this simple expression, you need to put this one. But, uh, and actually, for example, uranium or heavy nuclei, the charge is so large. So, if you remember, if you remember, this is D, eta is uh, Z alpha divided by H bar. Uh, velocity. So this one, basically, this factor is, uh, if you are thinking hydrogen, this is 1 over 100. It's usually small. But for the uranium, this Z times alpha is unity, close to unity. So it's always uh, sort of, there's some effect of the Coulomb interaction. So even though the relativistic case, you need to consider that this one. But uh, yeah, you can do it uh, some small correction with this. Uh, so here you have considered only the beta decay thing. Yes. Uh, but in ejector there are uh, lanthanides and actinides are also present. So possibility of alpha decay and fission thing is also there. And heating due to alpha decay is more prominent uh, than the beta one. So how significantly that can affect? Good point. So uh, maybe I think uh, I will talk a little bit tomorrow. So this is, uh, for example, alpha. Yes, you are right. So this is uh, so alpha decay are important for the very heavy nucleus. This is, for example, this point shows show the what is the binding energy of the alpha particle in most, you know, out most uh, high energy alpha particle in nucleus. And after this uh, nucle the mass number beyond 200, the, actually the alpha particles, these elements are alpha unstable. So how much alpha decay important it depends on how much heavy element here you have after the R process nucleosynthesis. That is uh, still a uh, uh, we don't know. Maybe tomorrow we can discuss uh, how much these element we need in order to uh, dominate this alpha decay over the beta decay. Okay. <laughs>